All right, so it, it's a code loader for Ruby. And these are the, the main features that the, li that the library provides. Uh, it is able to autoload code. It is able to eager load code, reload also, like we do in, in Rails. And um, it is designed to run in gems and in applications. So for instance, if you, do, if you, if you write uh, Rails applications, uh, there's something with the sound. Working? Good? So if you, if you write a, a Rails application, you know you can autoload code. Uh, you, you have been able to do that always. But uh, gems, uh, well, there, there's, there was some solution to do something similar. But in general, gems do not autoload code the same way uh, Rails applications do. That's the thing. So with Zyberg, that is, that is uh, possible. You can write your, your gems or uh, uh, any. In, it doesn't need to be technically a gem. Any Ruby project can, uh, can have uh, Zyberg as a dependency and autoload code the same way you do in Ruby on Rails. All right, first of all, let me show, let me show you how do you use this, OK? Uh, first, there's, there's a, a convention, which is A, which is that file names have to match constant names. Okay, we do already this in Rails, and if you are in a pure Ruby project, let's say, uh, that's the convention. The, 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 the project has to follow that structure, which is a very conventional structure anyway. So, for instance, uh, top level classes of modules. So, if you have user.rb, it should define user, no mystery, right? If you have user profile, it should define user profile in camel case. So. Uh, we are following the normal conventions in Ruby, which are that you have snake case in the file system and camel case in the, in the name of classes and modules. Uh, HTML parser good, uh, should define HTML parser. But look at, look at these lowercase letters. If that's fine for you, done. It works automatically. If you prefer that these ones are uppercase, there's a solution for that because you can configure a custom inflector that uh, is able to, you know, to to uh, configure exceptions to this basic rule, right? Uh, then the, the file paths match constant paths. In the case of di directories, directories should match to namespaces. Okay. In this case, uh, we have something that I call explicit namespace, which is that hotel.rb defines hotel. And then there's, there's something below hotel, hotel pricing. Okay? And that should live here in a subdirectory. So, sorry, in a, in, a, in a directory called hotel pricing.rb, okay? as we do in Rails. I call this explicit because the hotel name is space has, is explicitly defined in hotel.rb. There, there exists a hotel.rb that defines the class in this case. But sometimes we do not uh, define all the namespaces with an explicit file. For instance, in Rails, uh, uh, you can define something below uh, an, an, ad, uh, an admin directory. And you do not need to define admin.rb with a module definition. It just works. How it works? Because Rails, if there is, no, if there is not explicit definition, is going to define a dummy module for you with that name. Okay? It, it does that uh, automatically, and Zyberg does that as well. OK, so we have the project structure. Uh, how do we use Zyberg? Very easy. You instantiate a loader. You uh, tell to the loader which are the root directories of your project. For instance, in IGM, normally this is going to be lib. Everything below lib has the standard structure done. So one root directory in a Rails application is going to be app models, app controllers. There are several root directories. Okay. In Rails, uh, you are not going to need to do this because the, uh, Rails 6 has this integrated and the integration does this for you, right? But this is like the bare 
usage of the gem. Once you have configured the root directories, then you run setup. And setup does some minimal you know, starting thing that we are going to see later. In the case of gems, indeed, since normally you have one lib directory, which is the only root that you have, and also there's a convention in gems version.rb normally uh, defines the constant version everything in uppercase. So it does some, you know, some uh, small, you know, uh, convenience setup for for uh, gem-like loaders, and it's enough to do this. But you can also do the other thing in gems. This is not necessary. It's just a, a shortcut, all right? OK, then the basic API. There's more API, and the readme has it all. But the basic API is this. You set up the loader. Then you can auto-load. You can reload if you want, although normally only a service is going to reload. So if, you, if a service depends on five gems, and the gems uh, use Zyberg, those gems use, use Zyberg, normally those gems are not going to reload, normally, right? And if you are developing a gem, normally there's no service running. So you, you write the gem, and maybe you run the test suite, but th that doesn't involve reloading. So reloading basically is, is thought for services, raise application, and, 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 and other web applications written in other web frameworks, and in general, anything that, that has a daemon or something that is running, OK? Uh, eager loading um, is also provided, and this is convenient for production. Uh, by default, raise applications, for instance, eager load the code in production. Uh, when you ship a gem, you could say, just eager load my code, right? Eager loading needs auto loading. This is something that sometimes uh, you, we do not realize. But in order to, eager loading is not just required recursively. That, that wouldn't work in general. Because uh, files, if you, if you evaluate a file, it could be the case that at the top level, or a class level, or you know, in, in the execution path of, of, of that evaluation, you are referring to other constants. So in order to load, in order, you should have you, you should need to have like a dependent dependency graph of everything that is used everywhere, and we do not have that. So you cannot just recursively load. You have to, you have to have auto load set in order to be able to eager load a generic code base at least, All right? So thanks to having auto load, we can eager load uh, any project that that follows the conventions in the file in the file structure, which is uh, the only thing that we need. Finally, there's a, there's a, a, a method. Uh, Zyberg registers all the instances that, that are created. And then you are able, you have API to load, to eager load them all. And that's convenient, for instance, in production, in a Rails application. Um, uh, you want to eager load as much as possible on boot, OK? Then, no matter whether the, the, the dependencies eager loaded or not, you are able to say eager load the code of the application, assuming that it's using Cyborg, and also eager load the code of any other gem that I depend on that um, um, is using Cyborg. So in general, you are going to boot the main process with as much as possible things loaded, and this is in general convenient, and uh, you're going to load things earlier, um, copy and write, memory benefits, and that kind of thing, OK? Again, in a Rails application, you do not need to do this. Rails does this, OK? The integration does this. OK. Which is the motivation behind Zyberg? Uh, the initial motivation was the last one. Improve Rails autoloading. Why? Because if you are a Rails programmer, you know that autoloading in Rails has some edge cases, some gochas. Uh, it, it is practical. It has been used for many years, since the beginning, indeed. But it has some gochas. It doesn't follow Ruby semantics, and that's the, the main thing that doesn't quite square. But it was the best that, that we had. Okay, So uh, I wanted to improve Rails autoloading. But 
once I started working on that, I realized that this could be generalized and address another pain point of me, at least, which is that writing requires manually is brittle in, in, in Ruby projects. Okay? In Rails, uh, you do not feel this that much, maybe, because precisely you do not write requires in Rails. Everything is autoloaded. That's the magic. Okay? That, 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 that's, that's the cool thing. But if you, if you have written any non-trivial Ruby project, you know that this is brittle, where you have to write requires. It's brittle. Uh, dryness in, in, gener in, in generic Ruby projects, uh, well, th that's also a perception of mine. If, if I have a user.rb file and I need to tell Ruby require user, I have a sense uh, of duplication. Okay, I, so if all my files correspond to constants in an ordered way, I am always, I'm, I'm always rep repeating myself because everything is ordered. Okay, everything has a one-to-one a, a, a -one relationship between files and, and constants. So when I need a constant and I need to, to put again in, in, in a snake case the, the, the require for the constant to be available in a file, uh, I, I have a feeling of, of lack of dryness. I, I, could, I could solve this, remove this with, convention, with a convention, okay? A convention which is pretty natural otherwise. That, that's a pet peeve of mine, okay? Maybe up for the people, it's not a problem, you write requires and fine. Uh, but uh, this is something that I, I, wanted to, to, I wanted to solve for, for myself. Let's talk about requires for a moment. So for instance, let's say we have a um, locatable, I believe this is pronounced, uh, module that, uh, I don't know, for coordinates or, or something, you know, and you have a class with an airplane that includes this module. In a pure Ruby project, this shouldn't work. You are going to find an initialized constant locatable. Why? Because you have to do a require. You have to, you, you have to remember that you have to put a require. OK, require is going to, if, to load this file if it was not already loaded. And this file uh, is assumed that defines the lo locatable module. All right? So it's going to be available in this file. All right. But the problem is that require has a global side effect. So if you require locatable, this is not a compilation unit, let's say. This locatable is, from this point on, available in the virtual machine, everywhere. It's just a global, a global thing. So it has a global side effect. What happens is that, that this, without the require, could work. If someone in your code path, before you reach this point, loaded the module, is going to be available and you do not notice. You notice when in production, you, you, you hit a different code path and you have a constant missing, okay? It's super brittle. You have to be super disciplined, remembering everywhere, you know, that every constant that you use should have the corresponding require. Uh, other people, instead of putting requires, you know, selectively in its, in its file, <coughs> Uh, decide to uh, put them all in the in the main file, the main entry point. This is this is a nano C, which is a, a static site generator. Okay. Nano C uh, decided instead of putting all the requires in every single place. Well, you know what? I'm going to uh, conceptually eager load everything. This is this is the the main file, the main entry file of the, of the gem. Conceptually, it can load everything, and everything is available everywhere. Of course, you can you can see that this is not is not this has a cost. No, when you create a new file, you have to remember to go here, and also this has this has to this this has to be uh, there has to be an order here. You cannot put it uh, anywhere. Uh, you have to you have to uh, respect the dependencies between these files. So this is doable, but also um, has a cost in that sense. So just delete all this shit, okay? 
So this, this is nano is using Zyberg. Just delete everything. Instantiate Zyberg, done. I love this patch. Yes. <laughs> when I saw it, it was like, yes, th 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 that's it. That, that's the thing. So that's, that's the idea. You can streamline your programming. You, you, you just forget about this problem. Just name the, the constants uh, according to the file names. Uh, instant data loader, set up, done. Your classes and modules are available everywhere. That's, that's the thing. OK. Uh, auto loading and uh, loading in general, I, I tend lately to speak about classes, modules, and namespaces. But in reality, technically, we are, we are, this is all about constants. Okay? And knowing how it works regarding constants is key to understand how this works and w when you have a problem to understand where the problem comes from. So let me, let me just give you a quick refresher about constants in Ruby to have more context about the problem. So, um, you know, constants in Ruby, uh, one identifier that starts in uppercase letter is a constant, which is like a variable, a variable, but just it is not supposed to change. You know, constant, pretty common concept, normally pretty trivial concept in, a, in any programming language, but in Ruby is not trivial at all. It's not trivial at all because it is, it is uh, vinculated with classes and modules in a way that, that um, so classes modules are objects, they are an independent entity, and constants are storage. But there's, there's like a coupling between the two of them, because here we have a constant assignment as well. It is not obvious, but it's, it is. So this is clearly a constant assignment, right? This is also a constant assignment. It, it is the same thing as writing this. So C here is a constant. Think variable is a storage. There's no syntax for classes or modules in Ruby. OK? So here we had one assigned to x. What we have here is a class object assigned to C. So C just stores in one slide. It's a store is a, is a store in a one. In this slide, it's a store in a class object. It's a different kind of object, but it's exactly the same thing. From, from this point on, C is a constant. And C can be removed. The class object can be stored in, in another place. They are totally independent entities. For instance, this is super key. When you see this code, we, in, the, in our day to day, we, we see here use, u, the user class, the day class, right? But if we stop and think for a moment, what happens here is that user is an expression. User is a constant. The user constant evaluates to a class object, and that object responds to the new method. The return of this, the return value of this method is stored in this variable. Same here. Date is a constant. Evaluates to a class object that responds to today. The return value of this is we store it in a variable. So when you see this, in the day-to-day, -day, we think within classes. Okay? But in reality, in reality, technically, this is just a constant that evaluates to something. We could have this class object stored in a variable. We could have this class object stored in a different constant. Okay? They are totally orthogonal concepts. Constant belong, constants belong to modules, like physically. Like uh, top-level constants belong to object. And if you have a namespace, the constants within that namespace belong to the class or module that defines the namespace. For instance, here we have class hotel. That one is going to, to belong to object. Then we define within hotel module pricing. The, con the, the pricing constant is going to be stored in the, hot in the module that is stored in the hotel constant. That's all the thing. All right? So this thing is going to belong. The thing has many. 
module has many constants and it's like you, it's, you can imagine that internally you have like a symbol table or a hash table where the name of the constant maps to the value that is stored in that constant and this map or this symbol table is stored in the module and every module has his own uh, its own uh, symbol table like that so this this pricing constant that belongs to hotel has nothing to do with a hypothetical pricing constant that is at top level. If we have the same name, they are totally different objects. Pricing at the top level, it belongs to the system table of object, let's say, while this one belongs to the system table of hotel. There's, there's nothing, they have no relationship. Um, we have an alternative syntax to define that, like this. This is the same thing defining a pricing constant within the module that is stored within the hotel constant. Okay. We are going to see how constants are resolved very quickly. To introduce that, let me just uh, explain very quickly what is nesting, which is important for that uh, resolution algorithm. Uh, nesting, intuitively, if you see so I, I'm not going to do to give the full technical definition, but for the day-to-day, -day it, it is enough to uh, uh, to understand that when you use the class on the module uh, keywords like this, and you and you put uh, things nested like nesting namespaces, when you arrive to a point, the the classes and modules that are in each of these levels become part of the nesting like this. So the, at this point, the nesting is hotel pricing, which is this one, and hotel, which is this one. Okay, Object, which is, at the, which, which is at the top level, does not belong to the nesting. Here, this is different. We only have a module keyword here, right? Or there's, only, there's, there's only one uh, one one level of nesting. This is very important because the, the way things are resolved uh, is different here. Why? Because the nesting here has only one module, this one. Here we have two, because we have two levels. But here, it doesn't matter that the constant uh, has like two segments. It doesn't matter at all. You have one level of nesting, that's it. That's the nesting, only one module. Okay. Here we see the name of the module printed, but these things are objects, like the module object, the module or the class object. You know. Okay. So, if you see a listing, if and you wonder which is the nesting at some point, just go outwards. This indentation, and that's that's what conforms the nesting. The other one is an, an the ancestors. The ancestors, basically, of a, of a class of a, or a module is the, the, the chain that you have upwards with include modules, uh, superclasses, if you are working with a class, uh, and that's like linear, all right? So for instance, ancestors of a string, a string itself, uh, so this, this, this guy is, uh, belongs to the ancestors, and if, we have, if, if, if this had prepended a module, it, got, it, it would go indeed uh, before the same object. Comparable, which is a module, right? Object, this, this are, these are the ancestors. For instance, this is used when you want to resolve a, a, a method, okay? This is, this is going upward, so if the method is not defined here, you look here, otherwise you look here. This is the ancestor chain. Okay, so we are ready to quickly uh, revise the, the algorithms for constants. There are two cases. There are a, a few more eights, but these are the, the main ones. When we have a relative constant, like for instance, when you say a string in the middle of a, of a, of a, of a listing, all right? Ruby does this. First, checks the nesting. That means that uh, the nesting is conformed by classes or modules, right? So Ruby checks the first element of the nesting. The constant belongs here. Let's imagine the answer is no. It checks the next in the, mes in the nesting. Is the constant, does the constant belong to this class or module? Let's imagine the answer is no. It goes to the, all these, the nesting outwards. If 
the constant is not found in any of this class of modules, then it goes the ancestor chain upwards. So we first go in diagonal nesting, then in vertical ancestors. Uh, there's a technicality here that is that if the, mo if the, if the uh, inner module in the nesting is a, is, a, is a module, then it also checks object, all right? And that's why if you, if you refer to a string within any uh, place in a, in a module, you find a string even if a string does not belong to any, anyone in the nesting and it does not belong to the ancestors of modules because object is not an ancestor of modules. So you, so you need this special rule in order to find, to find top level constants. Finally, if you do not find the constant in any of these places, there's a callback, call it cons missing, that is call it. And it says, cons missing, I have not found this constant. The default implementation of cons missing is the one that raises name error but you can override that. Then if you have a qualified constant like digest MD5, in digest MD5, we have two constants here. Digest is a constant, and this one is like it, it is written here. This one is relative and could be resolved with the previous algorithm. MD5 is a constant that is qualified with, with colon colon. So this one has a different algorithm which is much simpler. You just check the ancestors of this guy up, that, and, and that's it. Cons missing as a fallback, OK? There's a, there's a technicality that object is uh, skipped, but um, that's enough, all right? Basically, nesting, so relative is nesting, uh, ancestors, cons missing. And if it is qualified, uh, you, do not, you do not check the nesting at all, just ancestors and cut missing. Basically, that's the idea. OK, so we are ready to understand how Rails auto loads, uh, uh, as a summary at least. In, in Rails, we have something that we call the auto load paths that represent the root directories, the root namespace object. OK? We have this. And, and in auto load paths, by default, anything that is a subdirectory of APP uh, is there. So APP models is there. APP controllers, APP helpers, whatever. Okay? And Rails defines a cons missing that uh, implements the autoloading or is the entry point to the autoloading. So what happens in Rails? If you have a uh, user's controller and user's controller defines or uses, uh, sorry, a user, the user constant, like in an action, you say user find params ID. You know, you, you are using the user constant. What happens if you, if the user <coughs> class is not loaded, uh, this algorithm is going to go to cons missing because the user constant is, is not known. And cons missing is going to say, okay, I am uh, user's controller, and I am told that user, a string, the name, is missing. Then Rails goes and walks the, the autoload paths looking for a user.rb. If it finds a user.rb, evaluates the file with load in, by default in development mode, and as a side effect of that, the user constant, if everything is okay, it's going to be loaded, and then you continue the evaluation of the, of the code. But this technique has limitations, as, and that is why we do not have Ruby semantics in Rails, like fully Ruby semantics. For instance, the nesting is unknown. You, you, all the information that you have is, I am user's controller, and someone wants to evaluate the user constant here which is the nesting at that point, no clue. Because Ruby do doesn't tell you. Uh, the, the callback, the API of the callback, just receives self and the name of the missing constant. That, uh, that's all the information you have. So we saw that the nesting uh, is part of the res resolution algorithm. And we do, not we do not have it. So it, that's a fundamental limitation of the technique that uh, Rails has used since forever. Uh, we do not know if the constant missing was relative or qualified. And in general, there's some special rule 
but in general you have to assume that Rails, since it doesn't have that information, is going to assume that, that it is relative. Okay? It is going to assume that. Um, then, consuming is the last step. Uh, that, that is important. For instance, uh, let's say you have, like in the example before, uh, a class hotel and includes a module called pricing. And your intention is to use the hotel slash pricing. That, that's the module, okay? But what happens if we have a top level constant pricing? That, that is top level, it has nothing to do with the constant that you want to use, but it is defined. What happens is that since consmissing is the last step, Ruby is going to find, in, the, in this algorithm, is going to find the top level one. I got one, here it is, and it, it is not the one that you want. You, you would like to autoload the one in hotel, which is the most specific one, but since, the, since Ruby is able to resolve uh, pricing to some constant. That's it. It's not going to call cons missing. So cons missing being the last step is also a source of some gotchas. Finally, it's not thread safe. So in Rails, uh, Rails has been thread safe for a while, but well, while many years already. <laughs> but um, in development mode, for instance, for autoloading. Uh, Rails is, is sets some locks and some stuff to be able to be thread safe. In production mode, normally that's not an issue because you eager load everything, so there's no there's no going to be auto loading normally normally in production. Okay. Um, okay, let's keep this one. No. This is how Rails works, and these are the limitations of the technique. How does Zyberg work? Because Zyberg solve that. So Zyberg uh, relies on, on module autoload. Module autoload, it, that's, that's something that comes with Ruby. All right? Say you have this module active record, and you say autoload base and a string. This means that. Uh, you, we are defining out, uh, active record. Then we are saying, if you in any place want to access active record column column base, Ruby is going to intercept that and is going to go and require this file for you. So this is a way, and this is in the in the Rails code base that's used a lot. Uh, it is a way to defer loading the file until you use it. Okay? So that's built in, in the virtual machine. And when I, when, I, when, I explain, when I explain it, the algorithms for constant resolution, I skip it one step, which is that every time Ruby checks in a class or module if the constant that is resolving, uh, uh, if the constant belongs to that class or module, actually it says, let's say, Conceptually, do you have it in the symbol table? If the answer is not, then still there's a second question. Do you have an autoload for it? And if you have an autoload for it, it's going to execute the autoload. So that's built in in the virtual machine, and that matches semantics. Why? Because it's injected in the, in, in the, in the actual algorithm. So it, it is going to find the constant, the one that you that, that the one that you uh, want, because in every step is doing these checks for autoload. But all right, yeah. So the same idea. You have autoload paths, and uh, the the thing is that when we run setup, when we when we sent it the the loader and put setup. The loader is going to walk one level of those paths, and it's going to the it's going to say, "Okay, you have user.rb. I am going to set an auto load for the for the user constant that that if used is going to go and uh, load user.rb." That's that's the the basic idea is this. Then from from here to the implementation, there's 
some stuff to resolve. But that's, that's the basic idea, and that's amazing. And because if this is possible, this is using API and, and logic that is built in the virtual machine. And why it works? Because the merit is from the virtual machine. We are just leveraging you know, this, this contract. So you walk uh, the root uh, directories and set auto loads for every one of the constants that should match the file names that you find. That's for the top level. There are some technical difficulties, nevertheless, with this approach. Uh, module autoload is something that I had in mind. I have had in mind for many years, because when I, I have studied this this topic, and, and it was like, oh man, if if we could if we could use module autoload, all these problems would disappear. But there were some technical difficulties. Some you could work around. Some you have been able to work around later. For instance. Module autoload uses required internally. That does not allow, in principle, to reload code. Because Rails is able to reload code because it does not use require in development mode by default. It uses load. Load is something that is provided by Ruby. It's not very common. But load basically is execute this file no matter if you already executed this file. It's just go and evaluate this file, load. All right. So in development mode, Rails uses load. When you want to reload, if you say load user, it's going to load again user. If, if, you, if you, instead of load, use it require to load user, because Rails, in the end, you have to load the file, right? So if you did require user, the second time in reloading that you use require, require would say, this is already load. Nothing to do. And you could, you could not reload. So in principle, this is a problem. Okay, but and Zabrick is published, so we, we have solved everything that is here, right? Let's keep it just a little bit of mystery. All right, uh, there's no API to remove auto load, so you have you can you can set an auto load, but there's no API to set remove an auto load, right? And this is important because if you are reloading, for instance, and you you had user dot rb in some place. And then you want to reload, and you remove that file, and you have a user to be in another place with different contents. You would like to reload to, to autoload that other one, but if you do not remove the autoload, it is going to is going to look for the previous file that that sh that couldn't be correct. Okay, so you have to be able to remove autoloads. Also, it does not support namespaces in the sense that you cannot you cannot say in object autoload admin colon colon user. You cannot say that. You, 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 you are only able to uh, set an autoload for one level. So in object, user. And then if when you load admin, you are going to be able to put an autoload for admin for, this, for the children of admin. But you cannot, you cannot pass qualified names to autoload, only one level. The other one is a chicken and egg problem that this was the, the, the most difficult one for me. Uh, and I am going to explain that one later. All right, let's see, let's see how we work around those difficulties. So as we, as we know, if you require a user and then require users again, the, the first one is going to load. The second one is going to do nothing because it is already load. That's the contract of require, right? Uh, OK, how does require know? that the file was already loaded. Because it has a collection of the files that have been already loaded, call it loaded features. OK, so it goes to loaded features. Well, it has to resolve this, right? You get a full path, whatever. And you go to load features and see if the file belongs to load features. If it belongs, fall, uh, false. If it does not belong, you load and true. All right? So that collection is mutable. If we modify the collection, you are able to reload again. Okay, this is an old trick that in Perl land uh, it's been known for, for, for forever. In Perl you hack every Perl you, you hack everything. So yeah, first first one solve it. Okay, we mutate load of features. It has been uh, it has been a, a principle of the of the development of the library 
to use as less hacks as possible. So the library on purpose uh, relies as much as possible on standard API from Ruby. The hacks are super, super minimal, super justified, and I believe um, not, not rare, uh, like this level, this level of, 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 uh, of, of hacking, right? Well, and this works. This is, the, I mean, the, the, I, I don't know if there's documentation that says that you can mutate this thing, but it could be very strange that this changes. So just a little hack, OK? Remove the file. You are going to be able to uh, require again, because there's no way to say to autoload that it should use a load. There's no API for doing that. Uh, this, that's you know written in in the, in the in the in Ruby, and there's no way to around that. So this is the workaround. Uh, removing autoloads. Well, there's no API, but if you remove the constant, even if the constant is not properly loaded, uh, that remove out. Uh, in fact, that removes the autoload. So this is enough, OK? And indeed, uh, something that I have learned uh, writing this library is that uh, for Ruby, an autoload, an, a, a, a constant that has an autoload, more or less, for Ruby, is as if the constant was defined. So the, all the API works. All right. Now, we said you cannot put an, uh, an autoload for a, a, a constant path. You have to do, you have to go one step at a time. So let's let's imagine that we have an admin directory. What do we do? Okay. So Zyberg, when when it does the the work, it says, okay, we have a directory here, and this and there's no admin dot rb, only a subdirectory. So what we do, this is also a little hack, is we set an autoload for the directory. Uh, this is undefined. I mean, uh, you can put autoloads for files, but for directories, but it works. What happens that when when admin is referenced, uh, autoload is going to require this file, and then we have super super thin um, wrapper around kernel require that says, "Hey, this is the, a directory that I managed." So we intercept that call. We intercept that call. In this case, we define a dummy module like Rails does. And then Zyber goes to this directory or directories, because admin could be defined in several directories, and does one level more and sets autoload to this admin module that it has been just instantiated. And this is the, this is the tricky one. And indeed, I did not solve this one. I, I copied the solution from another gem. All right. The thing here is, you have an, this is called, I call this an explicit name space in the sense that, in the, sense that the hotel class um, defines a name space and it has a file that defines the, the, uh, this class, all right? What happens here is a chicken and egg problem because you cannot, you cannot, uh, evaluate this file because this pricing is not is not ready for 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 having to to have this pricing ready you should be able to have the hotel class in order to be able to put an auto lot but the hotel class is the, the the thing that you want to have as a side effect of evaluating this file you cannot go here either because you need hotel so you cannot you cannot evaluate any of any of the two. They they have a dependency between the two. All right. So to solve this, uh, we set trace points on the class event. Trace point is an API, and there are several t types of, of of events that you can listen to. This is the one that is triggered when a class or module is created or reopened, all right? So basically, the idea is that we set a trace point to listen to class creations. And we, re and we register that we are interesting pre precisely in hotel. What happens? The thing is that we are able that way with the trace point to be called 
precisely at this point, before the, the class body is being executed. We are called it here. So since we are called it here, the callback that we instantiate, the, the, this block is going to be executed, we are on time to go to the directory and set autoloads. So when, when we reach this line, the autoload is set. That's, that was like, when I saw this was possible, it was like, OK, we, we have it. All right. Uh, so to finish the presentation, uh, the integration with Rails 6, which is I, I've tried to, 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 to integrate this uh, in a way that is as, as uh, transparent as possible, as well integrated as possible. So in Rails 6, it's going to be enabled by default. In, the, in, in Rails 6, now you have two ways to autoload, the classic way and the Zyber way. So if you generate an application, a new application in Rails 6 is going to have this, this line in config application.rb and load defaults 6.0 is the code that sets Zyrek as a, as a default auto autoloader. Um, if you do not have these defaults but you are upgrading to Rails 6, you still can uh, set it uh, as well, but well, this is the default uh, the, uh, that way. Um, this is API to be able to trace uh, the activity of the autoloader. Something if you if sometimes if you want to troubleshoot something, uh, this is very convenient. Just throw this in application.rb, and all the activity of the autoloader is going to be um, um, logged. In this case, so this this accepts a, a, a lambda and accepts a, a logger object as well. Okay, if you pass a lambda like this, this thing, uh, this is a trick to get a a callable here, uh, it just calls the callable with a method, uh, with, a, with a message. If you set a logger, uh, it, uses, it uses the, the debug uh, method of the logger. But this is super convenient and you, 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 do, not, you, not, you do not leave this permanently. Okay? So it's just, you know, you troubleshoot something and then delete this line, that's it. Then it could be the case, it could be the case that uh, and you have to configure some, some inflection because we are going in the opposite di direction of the classic autoloader. So the classic autoloader, in const missing, you get the constant name. And given the constant name in camel case, you inflect and go to snake case and look at the file system. So, but Zyber goes the other way around. Zyber starts at the file system and says, this file should define uh, this constant, okay? so underscore and camelize are not, this is not a, 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 a bijection, okay? You, you cannot, you, the, the one is not the inverse of the other one. In the common cases, they are, but if you start to use acronyms and that kind of thing, uh, they, are not, they are not the inverse of the other one. So for instance, it could be the case that you have some HTML or some API, something you know, and maybe you have to say in the flexors, uh, look, API is an acronym, HTML is an acronym. Okay, to have it, to have it inflected like you want. You can also rename the, the class, you know, and call it a day, and, and you know, and, and have HTML in lowercase, and that's it, you know. But um, if you have some, uh, you know, di difference res with respect to the previous autoloader, if you are uh, upgrading an application, maybe you have to add something here. Yes. Uh, no, uh, well, not really. Because what happens is that the, the constant is not found, and, and that's it. The constant. But, but in the moment, Cypher is uh, reading the class, uh, reading the file. It is not telling me the class name does not resemble the file name, so I don't get a, this error message in this moment. Uh, well, what is going to happen is that you are going to refer a constant that for which there's no autoload. So Zyber is not able to intercept that. And Ruby is going to say, I don't know this constant. Okay. So yeah, that, that's how it works. You say, HTML parser, not found. No. Oh, I have an HTML parser. Uh, then you have to realize that the, that the inflection is different. 
And then there's also a way to opt out. So that's the default. But if you if you are, for instance, upgrading and you have uh, you know work to do to the to you know for whatever reason, you can still you know use classic uh, this way. And this is this is going to be exactly the same thing that you had uh, before Rails six. Uh, yeah. All right. So that's it. Thank you. OK, we have a microphone. So if someone would like to ask any question, just raise your hands. Hi. Um, for the last slide, is there a way to do it incrementally? Like, uh, I want to use Sideverk for this folder, and I want to opt out for the rest of it, so you can do like uh, incremental migration when migrating to Rails 6? Uh, no. No. Okay. No, you, you either, no. Okay. Classic or Zyber, that's it. Cool. Any other question? I have an online question. Yeah, so I'll Excellent. read a, a question from the online viewers, All right. which is, um, could this auto-loading approach be added as a language feature to Ruby itself? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would love that. So the problem is that, the, the, the fundamental problem is that in Ruby, uh, there is there is no relationship between class and module names um, and, and 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 file paths. It's it's flexible in that sense. This is the way Ruby is designed. There are other languages that do not work that way. For instance, in Java, uh, uh, class uh, the class files uh, have very uh, very strict structure that matches the name of the class. And if you are willing to write the fully qualified name of, of a class, you do not need to do anything. It's, av it's available. As long as it, as it is in the class path, it's available. In Erlang, the same thing. In Erlang, you just use modules. In Elixir, the same thing. You just use modules. You, you do not have this required anywhere. So why? Because since uh, there's no option, your module name has to match the file name of the compiled file. There's no option. Then the, the language can rely on that and give you auto-loading, because in the end, they are auto-loading. Right? So since Ruby does not have this, uh, we have require, and we have all, all this, those, this way of doing things. And this is why Zyber requires the project structure. Mm -hmm. And I would absolutely love that Zyber was not needed. I would absolutely love that, that Ruby does this and and uh, you know and 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 it's something built in but uh, that's something that that belongs to the to the Ruby core team and I believe it's very unlikely because Ruby has been working with this with this contract since forever and I, I don't think it would be reasonable to expect that this changes but I would vote <laughs> plus one to that <laughs> thank you and the second question is, uh, what, would, um, what would be the migration path for a Rails 5 app? All right, the migration path. Um, good. So, in general, is going is in general should work um, for the majority of classes or modules if you have followed it. So, uh, the good thing is that. Uh, we are using the same conventions that are used by Rails. So since we are using the same conventions, the application is going to be ready. So the migration, th there's, not a lot, there's not a lot to do. Uh, things that, 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 you con that you could consider. Uh, first, that maybe you need uh, some inflections, like, like I, I explained it. Um, that could be something. And another thing that something sometimes happens is that you discover that your application was resolving a constant that shouldn't be resolved. Because it's used in a place where Ruby should not find that constant, but the, because, uh, uh, as I said, classic autoloading um, assumes, in general, except for some special rule, that the nesting, uh, ref that the, the, the name, the fully qualified name of the constant reflects the nesting, for instance. So sometimes, the classic autoloading finds a constant that Ruby 
I, I, I'm not going to say that it shouldn't, it shouldn't find it because uh, classic works this way. These are the rules. So it, it, find, it finds the constant according to the logic of classic. Let's say that Ruby would not find the, that constant. So since Cyberg uh, uh, matches Ruby semantics, the constant is not going to be found. Okay, that, that's, that's some its case, and I am going to document that in, uh, there's going to be a guide for this, and, it's, and, and also there's going to be an upgrade guide, uh, like, like Rails also uh, always have. And in the, in the upgrade guide, I am, I am taking notes of some people that have done upgrades, and there are some super edge cases that I am going to document. Uh, but, mm, uh, you know, apart from that, it uh, should be seamless. Seamlessly, or I don't remember how to pronounce this. Should be transparent, let's say. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, Xavi. Hey. Um, are you planning to ask for some change in the Ruby API in order to avoid doing that 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 hacks on Saber? Um, um, well, there's one thing that maybe I, I try to open at least an issue or send a patch, which is that this is, this is something that is needed uh, inside the implementation. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's, for instance, API to say, does this module has this con this, uh, have this constant? Does const define it? Okay, you can say um, a string const define it something, and if it's defined, it, it's going to say true, otherwise false. Okay, you can pass to that a flag that says, uh, please check also the ancestors. So basically, it would be if if I if I write a string colon colon this constant is going to give me something. If you check the ancestors, that's that's it. But you can you can you can pass false as in that flag. That means I am only interested in knowing that this if this constant belongs to this particular module exactly in 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 the in the symbol table of this module. Do not check the ancestors. Okay. All right. Uh, Zyberg needs that also for autoload auto -load question mark. So there's a method autoload question mark that tells you if there is an autoload set for a constant. And we use that internally. So that method does not support that flag. And that method always checks, uh, checks the, the ancestors. And, and um, well, the logic of Zyberg uh, needs an autoload question mark that uh, has that that is able to ask for uh, do you have do you exactly this module has uh, this autoload set we, we need that uh, the API is not there uh, I am sure is 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 doable because const define it has that logic so uh, I guess it's just not written okay so what what Zyber does is is uh, implements this you know internally. So if we don't have further questions, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Excellent. Right. Thank you.